Hey, it's Joe Glines from The Automator, and here's another episode of What We Automated This Week. Now, this week was a, a light week as far as working on scripts, because we had a lot of client work, but um, let me use Prompt Assistant to pull up our recently, let's see, here we go, recently modified files. It's going to run. Now, I changed it again to just look at my, my actual B drive instead of, well, not my B drive, sorry, my S drive, which is like everything we're working on, except for some client stuff. Um, here, we do have some client work for Danny and Kevin. Danny is a radiologist, and he's actually learning AutoHotKey as well. So it, we go a little bit slower in the sense of because sometimes we're teaching him how to do things. But um, very sharp guy. It's very cool. He's automating a lot of his mundane work. Uh, most radiologists spend most of their time talking, uh, and not their hands aren't on the mouse and a keyboard. So he has a lot of built-in stuff already for voice-to-text. However, you know, the navigation sucks, it's not, and also it doesn't automatically do things in a certain way. So, of course, we're customizing a lot of his tools. Sometimes we're building new tools, and I think there's one in here, one or two, that we'll show. But um, that they're, they're not confidential, right, so I can show those. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's really cool. And we have a lot of radiologists. We're actually going to probably create a page on the automator for radiologists because um, they're, they're good clients. Now, they're doing it. you got to know your stuff if you're doing stuff for them. I'll tell you that because um, most of the programs are automating. One of them was built in Java, I think, and we couldn't, even with UIA or ACC or anything, we could not peek inside that thing to save our life. So, heads up if you do try to automate stuff for them. Kevin is uh, an econometrics uh, like lawyer who testifies in court, and we're working on ways to get lists of attorneys who have his knee, they, they, they field courses in his area, location, geolocation, on his topic nature so thankfully a lot of the stuff is public uh, it's publicly available so we're signing in we're using Rafadian, which is a really robust um, web scraping tool with AutoHotKey to loop over stuff extract everything present a filter back to him and say okay which of these kinds of cases are ones that would typically you could be involved with and then we'll get a list of the professors and I just realized I'm not sharing my screen but that's fine let me switch to that um, Nothing I was going over there would, would really matter that much. Um, so, yeah, and I'm just tired. So, I'm not going to go record that. But anyway, so Kevin is doing stuff with that where we're automating that part for him. Um, we were, we found a place that was really interesting. And we're going to, we'll at some point release something more generic. But for, um, with the radiologist client, Danny, he wanted to detect if a certain program was using his microphone. Now, there was a graphical indicator on there, but we couldn't programmatically get the value, but we could see the pixels and if the pixel was green. But as Ace and I both, we, we wanted something both faster and more robust. And um, I remembered talking with uh, Ryan Wells. We had they had an idea of like, wouldn't it be cool to see if, if your mic is on that you could have a light to prevent like your spouse or something from walking in while you're recording something, which, hey, that happens to be a lot. Um, so that could be automated, which would be pretty cool. So we looked at that. Now, the one I had didn't quite work, but it still led us down the path to find one that does. And so now we can detect if a certain program is currently using the mic or and also the last time it used it. Um, and basically, if it's currently using it, the timestamp is zero. And if it then if it when you're done, it changes to a set time frame. Now, interesting enough, AutoHockey can't read that value. Um, it's very interesting. Both his ace and I had never run into this. There's a certain data type in the registry AutoHockey can't read. However, we used uh, the command line to use. I forget what it's called. Um, Isaiah pointed out to me because I had ChatGPT solve at least the first part of it for me, where it. Because the registry is just a text file, right? So we use a certain command, the command prompt, to read the text, and then we examine the text with AutoHotKey uh, and just for checking for certain values. So that's how we worked around it. So that was pretty cool. Those whisper paste. We did this, uh, I think it was in a hero group call. We demonstrated using the whisper text. Now, this is a V1 script, and it's also not Unicode, so which is unfortunate because some of the characters don't come through in the way they should. But it, uh, it uses the... ChatGPT Whisper API, it first records it locally to an MP3 file, then submits it to that, and then returns it back and pastes the text. Highly accurate. I was very, very impressed with its accuracy. I was just playing with it a bit more. Again, with the radiologist, I was just going to show him, but he's pretty happy with his voice-to-text functionality, so we didn't. I didn't end up showing that to him, but that's why that had been worked on. This blur stuff. So here's this, this is the main script. Let me open the folder. 
and let's see if we can get it to actually run. Now, we're doing this in V2. It's not done, but we're getting close, right? So I'm going to launch it. And I don't know. Oh, left shift, left mouse button down. So left shift and mouse button down. So I can draw a box. Now, again, that's not done yet. But see how it blurs? Oh, and that's where I also got to tell um, Irfan, we need to be able to move this after you draw it, right? But once it's done, you can move it and it sticks with the window. So imagine we had client data and you can do multiple, right? So, oops, now that was interesting. Now I do have the the DPI, on, now that adjusted for DPI, so that's great. So you can obfuscate things. Um, and then again, if we move this, it detects the program it's over, right? So it ties, it binds it to that window, um, but it's pretty cool. And I think, uh-oh, I asked him to get rid of the, the close button but it, it should work like the window snipping tool and just close it let me exit out of that script and, and maybe it's just me that maybe there's a hotkey for doing that perfect well I'm, let's just not worry about it but you get the idea right i think it's gonna be very cool for people who present online want to show stuff but quickly obfuscate now of course you can obfuscate post at, um production where you're recording and do it in your editor but man like davinci resolve it's a pain to obfuscate it's it's uh, just not fun so that's a cool little script we're working on. Or stuff. Here we go. Yeah, somehow I clicked that and changed the order. So FFmpeg. Um, I had asked, let me go ahead and launch the script because I want to demo it too. We're getting close to be able to um, to share this. And it's going to be a fee, but it'll be a low fee. Now, this is our GUI. It's kind of like Handbrake, but it allows you to easily... Let me um, grab a video. So here is my temp folder... And I have a given file. And now here's a short file, right? Uh, but this one, this is a longer one. Now I'm going to pause the video, but let's see, it's 9.57. I'm going to drop it in. Now, first, by the way, oh, let's change this to ultra. Eh, let's do faster. Ultra fast is definitely faster. <laughs> Duh. But um, the quality does, eh, let's just use ultra. Oops, ultra fast. Now it remembers what was selected from the last time. So I'm going to drag this into here. Now, this was worked on because I asked Urfan to see, hey, what if we can drag another one on top of it, and it would discover that. And we played around with it a few minutes. We sort of got it to work, but it stopped on the one it was running. And I'm like, you know what? It's not that important. Uh, maybe in version two, if we, we find this tool sells, then we'll do that. So, again, I'm going to pause the recording. It's 9.57, and we'll see how long this one actually took to record. All right, so it just finished. Looks like it took about 10 minutes for a 30 four minute video and what's interesting is um it went from one gigabyte to 105 megs now let me launch the one gigabyte and let me scroll ahead to get some air that's a good that's good right there so it's at 25 seconds let me grab a little screenshot here oh this, this is our yeah still issue with the d i have a the dpi adjusted to where it's not 100 um that's our window snipping tool issue but um all right now this is, again, what, a tenth the size? We go to that, and I'll jump ahead a bit and stop that. So let me bring this back. Oh. So you tell me, like, can you see? I can barely know. I think, uh, let me see if I can get this. So it's really a one-to-one. -one. That is crazy. Crazy! It's a tenth the size, and yet, like, you can almost not at all tell the difference. And that was at the ultra-fast speed. If you had done a better, a different speed, it would have done a better job of encoding it, right? So if you have large videos now, I, I wouldn't do it for home movie, and well, not home movies, but you know what I mean, like Blu-ray movies, sci-fi movies. But we record a lot of videos, obviously, because our hero calls us three hours a week, plus all our stuff for YouTube channel. And it's just really a kick-butt tool um, we have it now remembering what was preferred. We even have tooltips. Now, the tooltips, as I was explaining here, if I move over, like this stays, it can end up getting stuck because AutoHotkey doesn't know. So we need to add, he needs to add an on message. He pointed it out for Urfan, um, but we're going to have to go add that so the tooltips don't get stuck on the screen. And uh, But otherwise, it's looking pretty darn good. I I'm really excited about this. We have a couple in, in, uh, FFmpeg tools. But yeah, I think you get the idea. It's very, very cool. So that one, let's go ahead and get, again, it's a, a tenth the size. Um, and yeah, it took, let's see, um, 10 minutes. So a third, 
maybe use a rule of thumb. You say, uh, however long the video is, it'll take about a third that time to convert it, right? To re-render it. Um, but yeah, very, like I said, very cool tool. I use it a lot. I love it. Um, AHK Searcher. This one, now, Rizwan has been, we're not, al we're almost done with it. And notice, actually, it says AHK Searcher, but we're in the Google search, because originally it was just for Google search. And I had my version, which, let me launch my version. This is my version, which was, these are hard-coded, uh, and, and it was done because it was a simple GUI, and it didn't remember what was selected, right? This now new tool um, has a lot of the same functionality, but but more, quite a bit more. So let me launch it. Let's get us to the folder, and let me launch it. Now this tool, you can see, it, it looks a lot the same, right? Um, but what was selected when you close it and reopen it, it's remembered. And we need, I was going to tell our fam, or Rizwan, we need a, a button to get to preferences because there's actually, if you right click here, you can go to preference. Now preference is telling you control alt C, that shouldn't say preference. Um, that should say hotkey first off. So that's a good note um, that this should, this should have its own thing, say hotkey. And then this, you click it because that preference shouldn't be to bring this up. The preference is to trigger it, right? Um, you can select it. You can select your hotkey instead of having it hard coded you can change the font size so let's let's make this like a really big font i'm gonna hit apply and now it will react to it and you can adjust it but more importantly which was really cool was you can have a dark mode right i'm gonna hit apply and now we have like a dark mode so and i don't i'm not loving these colors i think maybe we'll make that gray a little darker and change this um color here uh, but anyway you get the idea right very cool also note you can use google bing or duckduckgo to do the search so that's why it's no longer a google search which is very cool now there was one other thing i was going to mention um we're what we're also going to do is right now these you are you can easily add a new location destination to use google to search right because google is a great search engine far better than most websites um, own search engines, but you can use Google to search it. And you can add to this list in the code, but what we're going to do is we're going to break out the code, these locations into it like a tab delimited file. And then that way people can put like the, what you want to have visible here and then the actual URL because stack overflow, I don't want to have to say stack overflow.com or youtube.com, right? Or facebook.com. A lot of these, you know, um, what it is. And, and this one is also confusing because it would be AutoHotKey on Stack Overflow. So this one searches Stack Overflow. This one only searches within AutoHotKey on Stack Overflow, right? And if you look at the URL, you'd see how I did that. But you get the idea, right? So um, we're going to move those to their own thing. And then there was one other thing I was thinking. Oh, we, yeah, we need a button here to bring up that preference. So we should have a button somewhere in here to say pull up the preferences because I don't want to have to always come here. Also, when you double-click this... That shouldn't open this. That should open this window probably, right? So um, it's very cool because you can say, hey, let me search these sites. Um, and let's do, of course, do the automator. Uh, also, if you have more, it'll it'll add them automatically and uh, you'll have a scroll bar. Or you can remove them easily too, right? But um, let's say uh, in true to GUIs, GUI, search. Of course, it opened on the other page, but it opens. See, it's using, in this case, Bing, because that's what we had, I hope, had selected. Um, but it uses them to search those websites. So, wow, really? There's no that on Stack? Well, that's just the generic Stack Overflow. Let's see. Um, Microsoft. And auto hotkey, examples of GUIs. But you get the idea, right? Because it's great to not have to type this. If you don't find what you want, I just click the other tab. I don't have to do another search. It's already done for you, right? So, yeah, I love that tool. I mean, I'm really happy we're leveling it up and making it uh, even easier. Oh, also, we built it where if, we'll say menus, if something is selected, what was it, control C? that will pre-fill this for you, right? Which is another really important thing a lot of people don't think about doing is, and also note if I say, Joe, I'm gonna copy this to the clipboard. So if I paste, you can see Joe's in the clipboard. Now I'm gonna select this, hit Control-Alt-C, menus gets put here, but when I paste, 
Joe is still there, right? We didn't lose the clipboard. So remember, you can always do that when, as long as you are using the paste and you control that you, when you paste, you can restore the clipboard after, right? Just make sure you add a little sleep there because um, it, sometimes it'll paste in, it'll restore the clipboard before you paste and that's really annoying. So this is all the Google search stuff, resizable GUI. Um, oh, man. Let me see if I can open this up. We're, we're almost done with this one. This is a V2 script, so let me, let me, oh, that's site anyway, but I need to close the V1 version of site, open the V2 version, and we were adding some new parameters to this resizable GUI. Oh, it's already open, great. Um, and so now, here's a simple example where you can just give it this, but you can also give it um, a title, the X position, the Y position. I don't, we don't, I don't know why he, well. It doesn't matter, but um, I wouldn't say put position. I would just say X and Y, that's fine. And the width and height, um, the font type, which that one, I, yeah, I, whatever. We put a default value, so that's fine. Um, personally, I, I don't know if I would have that because most people don't change it. And it's great having a monospace font. Um, the font color, absolutely. And then the font size and the background color. And that was part of what made me think about why we did the Google search with the dark theme was I realized, hey, let me see if I can run this. We'll get a couple GUIs um, up here because that was there. And you can easily change that background also in a list view and stuff too. So why not, right? Um, so this is just an example of having a very flexible, resizable GUI in your library that you can give it like nothing. You can give it a bunch of stuff. So he has three examples here, this one, this one, and this one, where he's demonstrating the stuff. Uh, but yeah, we're getting really close. I don't think there's anything else we're adding to it. Um, other than there should be a... No, there was... I thought we added that. I thought we had a destroy... I don't see it, though. Um, a destroy previous, right? Like, so you if it reruns again, it should kill it. Or maybe I'm thinking of something else, so... But I think that one's almost close to being done. Let me go back into here. The volume adjust idea. So, um, I use the... Uh, a media player it was borrowed from the v1 version i had years ago where we're just playing uh using um i forget what the command is in auto hockey i did it so long ago but you can just say run and i think run but it was i think there was something for music but it would play the mp3 file and it was a bummer because you couldn't like pause a song and so i had um Irfan, i think converted it over to v2 where we're using the media player but when i hit Control shift and scroll up and down Right now, it's incrementing in one increment. And before, I made a video on how I had them on different stuff. But um, what I wanted it to do, and, and initially, and I presented to Isaiah, I said, hey, have you ever done this? What I wanted to do is, hey, if I'm down, because sometimes if I'm on a call with Isaiah and the team, I want to. I still have music in the background, but set as like a volume one. And so what's really cool about that is it's just adjusting the media volume, that MP3 player volume, not my overall volume, right? But I can set it as a one, they can't hear it, which is really cool, but I can still have some background music on through my computer, it's really nice. Um, the problem is when I scroll right now, it's at a one every time. And man, if I'm up at 50 or something, if I'm cranking the tunes and I, and cause I have it hooked up to a stereo, right? Then getting down to one is a pain. Um, and also it actually a little weird when you're scrolling by one, it, it kind of reverts over and stuff. And so is that just like, oh, well we'll just build a step if it's below, 10, it'll increment a 1. If it's 10 to 15 or 20, it'll be a 2 or a 5 or something. And above that, we'll make it a, a 10, right? And I said, no, no, no. That I said, I could do that. Like, I'm not looking for that. I want an algorithmic approach to where it, it programmatically is adjusting the increments based on where I am. And so um, I had ChatGPT create a simple example, uh, but we haven't, increment, we haven't implemented that yet. So, but we're working on it. But that's what that was. Um, just getting that across. This muke mite. This is pretty cool. Let me let me demo it. Um, so let me run it. Now when you run it, now I don't know where it's going to show up. What? Oh, because I've already ran it. Um, it didn't default. If you haven't run it, it does something different. So that's funny it's already limiting it to just that one mic um we're getting better right so we're filtering the microphone let me turn that off so you can see how many there are right and we launch your system sounds and then what you would do is scroll down and you would see oh here's my mic and we're going to use 
um, UIA, hopefully, to outline this so people know where to look. And then you basically would go through, let me go back and filter the mics. Okay, now um, I can hit this and mute. So I was talking, and I don't know if you noticed, this didn't work. And of course, that means that my mic's not there, right? So um, this, we can we can assign a hotkey, Control-Shift-M, which means once I select a mic, you, you pick your mic, you select it, and then I can have a hotkey to toggle my mic. It's not toggling it within the program. It's toggling the mic itself, and so it's really cool. I could have a hotkey. Now, Zoom, you know, a lot of tools have a hotkey for this, but not all, right? And that was what the radiologist Danny, his tool didn't have that built in. So this is really, really cool, right? And I also told Isaias and, and her friend, I'm like, maybe we should set it up where you can also mute your speakers, because sometimes I'll be on Zoom, and I want to have a quick conversation with... Um, someone that walked into the room and I don't want to have to go turn down I just want to hit a hotkey kill my sound but not necessarily well maybe even kill both my mic and my sound so I can have a private conversation and then turn them back up toggle them back basically right not adjusting them so um, that's what this one is we, we, we change it to where we have an icon here and so and if I hit mute this mic this icon here also updates so and we demonstrated that a while ago so well I forget what the <laughs> let me click it um, control shift M. Move my Mac out of the way. I'm going to hit it just to show. So we're also using our notify, but also notice these show and the system tray icon shows. So lots of nice ways to, to help you know if it is muted or not. Uh, we could have those stick up, or maybe if you mute it, maybe it should stay up if it's muted. But when you get rid of the mute, it shouldn't stay up. I think that's a good idea. Um, so yeah. And then... We also said when that GUI closes, this window should also automatically close because I'm done basically with that. So yeah, that, that one's in the works. Um, we're just adding the script object. This contrast, this is another one we're working on for Danny. And this one will be like his tool because the mic mute, anybody can use that, right? So we're building that in our own time and stuff and, and he'll get to use it because it's a cool little tool. This contrast one, we won't have a need for it. What was really interesting about this was we had done it. We tested it. It was working great. Let, let me open it and just see so an idea of what's going on here. So I'm going to run it and see. Oh, look, we even have a review. Do we have oh, an F1? Apparently, and we're having to try to make sure we, you know, include a hotkey that you can change. But I think here you can choose the different hotkeys. Um, now F1 is going to grab an area around that and then tell you how bright it is and the contrast. So let me try it up here. Um, 19 and 19. Oh, brightness 100. Yeah, so that's working, right? He wants to adjust x-rays automatically. And so again, the getting of the pixels is one thing, and then the adjusting in his tool, you have to do certain things, which we don't have to go into. But um, what was fascinating about this was we said, hey, we at least got the front of this working. Let's give it a test. So he gave it in, he's like, yeah, it's not working at all. Like the numbers aren't changing. And so, you know, we're like, well, what? You know, it worked fine for us. Let's, let's, wait for a call so we get in a call and he's doing it and sure enough the num numbers aren't changing right and so we came up with the idea i say we Isaiah also said hey yeah that if it's using is it direct x to draw it's done in memory and the gdi approach there's three levels that Isaiah mentioned there's the gdi there's another one i don't remember what it was and then um the direct x is like lower level memory and he's like maybe shin or spanova um, has a tool that can help Go do that. So we we went and, and sure enough found a library from Shin, which he's got a video on it. And I think he actually maybe we, we demoed that on, on our channel. He came on our channel at one point and got it working. We're like, oh yeah, it works. And so be thankfully during that testing period where we were like, well, let's switch between his and ours. And thankfully during that testing period, Irfan on his computer went to the other monitor to test one part. And both of them failed. And uh, no, actually, no. Shins worked, but ours didn't work on our own screen. And we realized, well, wait a minute. We were always testing on our primary screen, not the other screen. And so it had, it actually had something to do with the, I think it was the mouse coordinates of um, the pixel get color or something, right? Like on, on it. And so we were able to fix, long story short, not really short, but. We were able to fix our version. We didn't have to use Shin's library. Not that he would care either, right? We would cite him, but um, it didn't bring, it brings, it is faster, but um, it the speed's not an issue anyway. So we just kept it simple. So less things to break. We're in control of the library. Um, 
that's another reason why. So yeah, you get the idea. So that that one and and again, I I don't think we're gonna release that anywhere because I don't know who else would want that. Um, Res Finder. So Isaiah has a tool that he wrote, and he we were discussing. He's like, oh, I wasn't. That's not really an automator thing. I did that at my own time. I'm like, yeah, but I wrote. I paid for people to go tag the videos, and neither of us are you know fighting over this, but um. It was all in good nature and stuff, but so Res Finder, when you, and, and uh, personally I hate the name because I'm like it, only a programmer would call that Res Finder, right? It's really an icon finder, so it loops across the DLLs, and we paid to have the things tagged so I can say like person, and it will filter on just people, right, or persons for that matter. Um, blue, so you can see how we've tagged a lot of stuff to have it. Um, and I'm not sure why these have... Maybe that's part of a, a word. Um, I wonder if I could put... Nope. Let's try greens, not... Yeah, there we go. You get the idea, right? And you can add tags. So I could select this, see the tags that it has, and then I could append new tags if I cared to, right? So um, it's very cool because also I forget what it is, but if you click it, yeah, it'll give you the load. And I think if you right-click it... No. Shift-click... There's another one that gets it, or maybe we're not done with it yet, where it'll get it for the system tray icon. So it'll, it'll make it very, give you the code for it, right? For an auto hotkey. Now, generally speaking, this is a great tool for anybody, regardless of whether you're using auto hotkey or not, because there's nowhere where you can just say, let me filter these icons across the DLLs based on their description or what they are. And we thought about having AI do this for us, but we just, it was about a year ago we did this. And um, it's a cool tool. But, but what happened was Windows 11 came out. And Windows 11, those genius Microsoft engineers changed some of the icons for the, the DLLs and what they represented. And so Isaias and I both kind of went, threw our hands up and said, screw it. Um, we didn't look at it, but someone in the hero group the other day was mentioning that they were trying to select an icon. And so we looked at it and we're like, okay, well, we'll, we'll get it where we can actually share it. But um, yeah, it was a major bummer when, when we found that. So it's, uh, it is on its way. Um, unit tests, I'm not sure, set view banner, ah, that was for the, because the search in that one, let me, do I still have it open? Let me, let me go back to it, because I'll show you, it's a cool, it's a, a very cool functionality, so let me run this. Now, see how this says filter by tags, which I still wouldn't call that, I know what he's doing, but I would call that search by tags instead of filter, but you get the idea, right? That Q, when we click off of it, let me click here. This text, it's not, it's a queue, and that's what it's called. It's like we set preset text there, but it's not actually there. When you click it, it disappears, right? So you don't have to have a label to the left saying um, filter by tags. He's got text here, so you know that's what it's for, right? Or the tags here, um, here you can say current tags, right? Um, so it it's a great way to avoid having to have another label somewhere. So it's something you can do with AutoHotKey. It's very convenient. It's just hard to remember what it's called, for, at least for me, because I don't think of it as a queue. Queue, in this sense, is like an indicator. It's a, you know, uh, this is what's going to be there. It's a suggestive thing. So you get the idea. So uh, this participant tracker, I was listening to a podcast, and they were talking about how important it is when, like, when we get a new hero member, um, as Ace and I both noticed, we've been doing this now for like a year and a half, right? And if people join the hero calls, like the live calls or Telegram, they are far more likely to stick around, right? Most people actually, it's a, it's a really high, um, I forget what it's called, but we don't have a high churn rate, right? The people stick around, it's great um, for the most part. But those that do leave, usually it's because they don't actually join a call and they join, don't join the Telegram group, right? Which is a private group that we, we help people there during the week in Telegram. Um, and then uh, Fridays, we have two hours of calls. Saturdays, there's one hour. And uh, anyway, unfortunately, we don't. it's not easy to figure out who joins the calls and who doesn't. So I have a script that Irving had written for me that lets me know when people join a call, right, and it has their name. But I'm like, hey, why don't you write that as a log file? And at some point, we will write that, and then we'll track of who's attending. And more importantly, we'll compare it to hero members and say who's not attending and then we can go out of our way to try to get those people to actually attend a call to really increase the likelihood that it, it's honestly it's really so they get the value right I, I want them to stick around i like the revenue but it's really more about i want to help them and if they actually join a call they'll see it's an incredible value like they're getting 
leveled up like you won't believe. And so I, I highly, again, we, we also dropped the, we have an introductory price where it's like one ninety nine for the first month, and then it's like fifteen ninety nine after that. But it's it's so crazy to think about the price on that because it's it, everyone uh, the hero members are there. They're like it's it's an incredible deal. So anyway, that's what we've been working on. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, please like the video if you learned something. It really helps us out. And uh, have an amazing day. Cheers.